for watching another Nerd Stalker interview. Okay, we're live. Um, welcome to another Nerd Stalker interview. Good morning. This is Greg Valoria, AK Social Greg on Twitter for the Nerd Stalker Media Network. Today we'll be helping people with their elevator speech. So uh, we, we talk with uh, Nicole uh, Lidinger, right? Lidinger. Lidinger. Leininger, okay, sorry. I should have even asked you for that. Yeah, Director of Corporate Communications at EventHelp, um, leading inventor service company, which helps people get their ideas reviewed. And uh, we'll have Nicole talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, Nicole will you know, kind of tell you today the 10 do's and don'ts for your elevator speech, as well as give you some help around how to deliver your elevator speech and maybe consider the audience for your elevator speech in, in developing your elevator speech. So anyway, good morning, Nicole, and thank you for joining us on Nurse Hawker Live from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right? Good morning. Yes, I'm in Pittsburgh. <laughs> how, how's the weather out there today? It's beautiful. I'm going to move my office outside, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I think because with this uh, wireless world we work in, uh, you, you could do that very I'm easily. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, you know, thanks for uh, you know talking to us uh, today about elevator speeches because I think it's it's a valid topic today as it was years ago when uh, they first talked about that. And you know, I I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know uh, you know a key. It's a key element in networking, obviously. And I was always trained at the 60 second elevator speech, or at least that's what they always told us. I, I took Dale Carnegie and they talk a little bit about that. But is that still true today? I would say it is true. I think sticking to 60 seconds, I, I always say between a minute and two minutes. You know, it, I would never go over more than two minutes. Uh, because I think you you know you have the potential then to lose people, but I think sixty seconds is always great because that will then leave you time for feedback from your audience. And I think if you go on too long, then you could potentially lose them and and then potentially not get any feedback. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, interesting because um, in a way, when we meet people, right there's always an opportunity to have that type of elevator speech, right? I mean, you don't have to be in a convention or, you know, at a real networking event. I mean, just in real life, right? You're going to use this, right? Right, right. I mean, you could be in line at Starbucks and overhear a conversation. And next thing you know, you're giving your elevator pitch to someone, uh, you know, that you, you weren't even thinking that was going to happen. So there's always real life examples and things that can happen and, and give you the opportunity to, to pitch your product. Well, you know, let's go through your list here. Let's, okay. let's, let's talk about the do's and don'ts of elevator speeches. So, uh, you know, why don't you just kind of hit some of the top points you, you want to tell us today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, the first thing you want to do, the first do would be to start with a great hook. Um, you know, we were just talking about the, the direct response television industry and the, you know, infomercial industry. How many times have you been sitting at home watching and you see the commercial of the real life example, you know, have you ever tried to give your dog a bath and they run through the yard? You know, it always starts with this, <laughs> with this question and you're sitting at home saying, geez, you know, I, I that did have, actually happen to me. Next thing you know, you're picking up the phone. So that, that kind of goes hand in hand with the elevator pitch. Um, you know, you want to grab your listeners attention and you want to be able to pull them in. And again, you want to do that in a couple seconds. Wow. You know, when you say a couple of seconds, that seems like so much pressure. I, I, I know. Think people psych themselves out with this thing. I know, I know th you know, when they, I tell them about that, they, they like, they look at me like, how am I going to do that? But, right. um, you know, but I, I think uh, you're going to go into some other things that'll help that. Right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, nine times out of 10, this product, you know, obviously I work with inventors, so I, I kind of take things from a product and, and, you know, that kind of standpoint. Nine times out of ten, your product does solve a problem. That's why, as an inventor, you came up with it. And literally in one sentence, you can probably explain to someone, you know, what kind of problem this product solves. Um, so once you've delivered the hook, you kind of want to then dive into, you know, what that problem, what this invention is going to solve for you. And one thing I always say is inventors are consumers. And it sounds really basic, but it's true. They are very creative people and they 
will go to the store to look for a product and when they can't find it on the store shelves that's when they go home and say I'm going I'm going to invent this and so um, you know most like I said a lot of pro products that I see that inventors come up with they solve a problem so you really want to kind of um, you know stick to that quick that quick hook and then go into the value proposition as to what this product you know what the problem is that's going to solve and the value proposition what i found nicole when i when i talk to people or you know you know the 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 entry question to the elevator speech is so so nicole what do you do right yeah and and that's your that's that's your entry right but but a lot of times is that sometimes um you know some inventions can be somewhat complicated right so right. yeah how, how do you get these guys to kind of concise that 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 part there you know well a lot of the inventors that i work you know obviously that this the the range of inventions you can have a, a basic household product all the way up to a very technical you know piece of technology so it's a little easier obviously if you've got a a basic household product that you're trying to describe like I said, giving your dog a bath, that's pretty easy, you know, um, you know, hiding the dirty dishes in the sink. You know, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen it all. And these are our products that are, again, a little easier to describe. Um, if it's a more technical invention, again, it, it kind of falls on the inventor or the creator to really figure out a way to simplify that idea so that the common person who's listening to the pitch will will be able to understand and and be able to figure out what it does quickly mm. um so you always want to have data to back up your claims so for example once you kind of ask the person what their pain points are and you know you tell them what this problem is you know what this is going to solve um you know you kind of want to have some data and statistics to back that up and explain why this invention is going to solve that problem um and you know you want to just be able to while you're doing this be energetic and make sure that you haven't lost you know lost the person's attention quickly um, because sometimes you may start your pitch and the person may say oh i don't i don't work in that industry and walk away you know so your goal is to try to keep them engaged even if they work in a different industry altogether mm, that makes sense yeah no, so, I, I totally get that yeah you know, you've got an automotive product and you're talking to somebody who makes pots and pans you know there might not be a connection there but you never know there there may be so the goal is to try to keep everybody engaged um and you know you want to be able to um if you have a website you know i always suggest making sure you throw that out as well because again someone may remember that and you know or let's say you have a crowdfunding website throw that out so that way a person can then leave and go get some more information yeah the um you know, it's interesting when you say that about inform the informational part. You know, you you know, check out my website at www or you know, hey, you know, I I I just started a a Kickstarter campaign. You know, you could just look it up at you know, um, and, and you know, people kind of sometimes rush with through that with me, and then I I totally miss it. So um, you know, the card is going to be very important and and all that type of stuff. But you know, that's, those are good points. Yeah, go ahead and. Uh, Keep on going down your list here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Business cards are very important. And I always tell inventors that you can literally go to Kinko's and spend, you know, $20 and, and get a stack of business cards. They don't have to be perfect. They literally can have your name and your phone number and your, you know, email and, and, and um, website and at, at least something to, to hand to um, a business person that you're giving this pitch to, especially when you're in a trade show forum. Obviously, you know, I work with in trade shows and, and go to a lot of trade shows. I always try to coach inventors two things. One, to make sure that they, they do have a business card because the thing they have to remember is while this invention or new product is the most important thing to them, that business person that they're talking to, that business attendee, has to go to 300 booths and is you know collecting information from a lot of different people so you're not the only person that they're talking to and on the flip side i always tell inventors to make sure they get a business card from the person that they're speaking to and write a note on the back of the business card because once you leave that forum even again if you are in line at starbucks write down a couple bullet points about the conversation because you might think you'll remember but sometimes you don't 
No, absolutely. I think uh, when you're at a, uh, a convention like yours where you have hundreds of booths, um, it, it'll it'll slowly blur after the yes. first 10 or 15, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I've had this happen many times where I've had attendees actually call me, business attendees call me and say their luggage got lost on the way home and they lost all of their business cards and everything that they collected. So that's why it's so important for the inventor to make sure that they have proper notes as well, because they could be waiting to hear back from someone and they, the person lost the cards. So that's just, you know, that's, that's, you know, maybe not necessarily in the do's and don'ts of the elevator pitch, but I think that's an important lesson for inventors to know when they're starting out. You have to stay organized and, you know, make sure that, that like I said, a business card is, is really important. Yeah, and these devices these days is one of your friends. So, you know, you could get a lot of apps that allow you to scan business yeah. cards for this guy. So Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. All right. Let's yeah, so down the list here. So those are those are um, some some do's, and then um, you know regarding regarding some don'ts, you want to forget you know don't forget to practice, and it's really important to you know again trade shows are a good way to practice, but you can also family friends. Um, like I said, in random places, you know, the thing you have to remember with family and friends is they may be biased. <laughs> so they may tell you it's it's an amazing idea. So yeah, just a little um, bit biased. Right. If you're my family, they'd probably say, no, it's not. <laughs> They, they tend to be honest, um, but you know, you just, you have to kind of, you know, take what they say with a grain of salt, but it, it is, it's a great way to practice. Um, but you have to keep in mind, again, if you pitch your product to your family and friends and they tell you that it's the most amazing thing they've ever seen, you can't be disappointed then if you go to a trade show and maybe you don't get that same type of feedback from the general public or from, you know, businesses. But again, that is a great way to practice. Well, you know, I had a question for you about that. You know, in your in your experience, uh, I, I know it probably varies by person, but you know, how many times do you think a, a a person will go through their elevator speech and finally feel comfortable? You know, in in your in your experience. Oh, I think it could be hundreds, hundreds of times. Honestly, I mean, it really, it really. <laughs> and um, you know, I had we were kind of trying to help inventors. We had a Shark Tank. You know, the show Shark Tank was at our show this year, and the inventors literally got sixty seconds to go in in front of the casting crew to pitch their product. So we were trying to make them understand how important that sixty seconds really is, because after that, you know, you're you're done. And it takes it takes a lot of practice to really fine tune exactly what you want to say and to really sell it and and you know get get the main points across. So yeah, I would say it, it, it takes a while to, to get it, but once you get it, you know you're you're golden. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. I I better go about another uh, nine hundred ninety nine to go. Practice. <laughs> I better go to Starbucks a lot this week. Um, <laughs> anyway, oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so, let's go down the list of don'ts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the next thing, the next don't is you don't want to oversell your idea. That's that's one big mistake that inventors make. Um, is you know you don't want to oversell the benefits. You don't want to use words like revolutionary or life changing, um, especially for an inventor who hasn't manufactured the product yet. So you may want to stick to conditional tense. This would do this. This could do this. You know, we we tend to do that with our inventors who were just starting out. They're in the early stage. Maybe they don't even have a prototype. You don't really know if this product hasn't been tested or manufactured yet what it's going to do. So you kind of have to be careful about overblowing the potential of the product if you don't know yet. You know, it's almost like that black box theory, you know, can this even work? You don't know, you know, so you, you have to kind of, you know, think about that. So it's um, kind of like an honesty, but positive approach towards your product, right? Right, right, exactly. And I always try to stay away from even, you know, obviously the revolutionary, you know, those, those overblown buzzwords, but even like the saves money, this is going to save you money. You know, again, sometimes you don't know that. And so I try to, you know, we try to stay away from, from hype or hypey type words like that. Um, because you just well, don't, know. You, you know, and, and I think a lot of when people 
pitch me on ideas. You know, we have a lot of startups here and um, they, they ask for my services, but you know, part of it is part, you know, when I ask them, you know, so, you know, what does your company do? Or, you know, um, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about this on, on, cause sometimes they, they, they use adjectives that, that kind of imply like they'll say, well, it has the potential to, or, you know, how do you feel about when someone says that to you, you know, where, you know, it seems like you're unsure, but it also leaves you a little bit questioning about is, is their product really viable? You know, right. when they use those words, right? Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I would, um, you know, you kind of have to walk the line on that between not overblowing, but also I agree with you when you use those words, like it has the potential to, it kind of leaves the listener questioning a little bit as to whether the product really is going to do what the inventor, you know, says. It almost kind of makes the inventor look like they're not sure and they're almost a little uneducated about about the product. Right. So I, I agree. I would almost kind of stay away from, you know, from from those types of buzzwords just because, you know, I, I think it can almost go the opposite way. Yeah. 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 Like you said, it's a fine line, I believe. Right. Yeah, I agree. Right. I think it's always a little easier if an inventor has already manufactured the product and mm. they have it in front of them, they at least know that it is going to deliver X, Y, Z. Yeah. I, I always like those guys like take it out of their pocket or jacket, you know, if it's small enough, obviously, right. you know, and right. then they say, Oh yeah, I have, it, I have it right here. Right. 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 I'm pretty so, impressed by that. Um, one, another thing that you want to do is obviously, and we talked about this in the do's that you do want to have data to back up your claims, but you don't want to bury the listener in data. Um, you know, I think if you're just throwing out too many numbers to someone and you're throwing out all of these different claims and data that you may potentially lose the person because it just may be too much for them to take in. You know, sometimes your brain is just trying to process one thing at a time. And, and if an inventor is throwing too many statistics out, you may end up losing them. So I would say to maybe pick one or two quick bullet points that you know, are, are data driven, but, you know, just kind of stay away from giving your listener too much data. Because again, in 60 seconds to two minutes, if you're just throwing out statistics, it's, it's, it's going to, you're, you're going to get that like blurred look by the, the person who's, <laughs> who's listening. Now, now, do you suggest like um, in the middle of the elevator speech um, to kind of get uh, reaffirmance from the person? Like, does that make sense? Or, you know, how do you feel about that type of interaction when you're doing your elevator speech? I think that that is I think that's fine. And I think that, um, you know, I think one of the questions that you we, we had talked about or going to ask is, um, you know, kind of using the audience to, you know, gauge you know, where you are in the elevator pitch. And I think that a lot of times you can quickly gauge where the person is, you know, that you're, you're giving the presentation to and whether you should continue, whether you should not, you know, so I think it's fine to do that, to kind of ask a question halfway through. And I think you can quickly tell if the or the listener is engaged or if they've now gone somewhere <laughs> gone somewhere yeah. else yeah they're looking they're looking beyond you or something the next like booth? That. yes yes exactly <laughs> so you know that usually will tell you whether you need to wrap it up or not <laughs> no that's good i know i appreciate that i think that's good advice because i think that uh, i see a lot of people are very mechanical with their um uh, and that's why i guess you, with their elevator speeches, because I, I guess that's why you say it could take hundreds of times because, you know, once it feels comfortable, then you kind of know, I, I, I don't know. I know when I explain some things to people, I kind of know that, oh, I got this down finally, you know? Right. Right. And like I said, it's always about finding the fine line between, like you said, being too mechanical on one end or being so over the top on the other end that you turn the person off as well. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, you've got to find that, conversation, you know, where you're, you're just kind of engaging with the person and you've been able to draw them in without being obnoxious, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, a couple more don'ts. Don't ignore your competitors. I think it's, you know, it's important to, 
you know, mention your competitors. You don't necessarily have to mention their products by name, but you can, you know, mention, communicate that your product may be better than some of the other products on the market. Again, you don't have to mention their exact names, but, you know, I think it's important for the listener to know that your product could potentially replace another product on the market. I mean, we all know, we've all heard this, that, for example, you if you want to get your product in Walmart, there's only so much store, there's only so much shelf space. And everybody says, I want my product to be in Walmart or I want it to be in Target. Well, you're fighting for, you know, 12 inches of space in that product line, whatever it is. And so you've got to be better than the next guy to be able to, you know, remove that product and get, get your product in on that space. Because a lot of times that's really what it comes down to is, is shelf space. Um, so I think it's important to let your listener know that this product could potentially replace X, Y, Z. And, and it's better because of these reasons. Yeah, that's a that's a big PR no no. I think. I mean, you're you're the director of communications at your company, so you, you know what this is all about. I I, I know a lot of times uh, when I'm shooting interviews, um, uh, especially on location, uh, not necessarily like this, but on location, they'll they'll mention a competitor, and I actually have to stop the camera and I said, you know, I mean, I could edit this. I told them, you know, we're not right, doing this live right. like this, right? Um, so the potential is a little bit less, but I, I, I agree with you. I think mentioning competitors um, is a, brings up a lot of red flags, I think, to a lot of people because, um, you know, why are they trying to sell this too hard? You know, why are they right. trying to compare this? You know, and especially if it's a bigger brand, I mean, whoa. Right, right. Really it just could take a negative turn. You know, it, it could end up in, in turn making you look negative when that's not what you're trying to do. So yeah, I totally. think, again, it's a delicate balance. But, you know, again, when you start mentioning names, then, you know, and again, when you're the little guy, you know, when you're the inventor who's got one product and you're throwing out a huge name or huge brand, again, it, it you know, the potential is there to, to make you look negative. Mm, that's very true. Yeah. And so the last don't really is, you know, don't forget the call, the call to action, the call to action. In the end, you know, your elevator pitch, it's a sales pitch. So you kind of want to leave people, you know, figuring out what is the next opportunity, you know, what's significant opportunity here? What should the listener do next if they're interested, you know, kind of goes back to the whole website thing. You know, that's really the good time to give them your card potentially get their card, say, hey, I'm going to follow up with you or, you know, let's schedule a follow up in a week, you know, that kind of thing. But again, it is a sales pitch. So you want to try to, you know, close them at the end after you've given them all of this information. You know, you know I wanted to ask you, you know, before we close off the interview, you know, I think that that was another great, great tip um, is the closing. Um, you know, going back to we were talking a little bit about the audience. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of reflecting back on how I did it. I, I mean, I was a product manager, so I, I was at trade shows a lot. And, um, you know, I, you know, that gauge thing that you had mentioned earlier in our in our interview here is so important. It, it, you know, it's like, am I talking to the CEO or am I talking to a, a decision maker in the company? You know, I mean, how, how, how 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 do you how does audience play into your elevator speeches? You know, do 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 you kind of coach these people that you may have to adjust it if it's a C level executive versus you know someone else? I mean, how do you, how do you? Absolutely, tell about that? I, I think for the most part for inventors, I think it you know it needs to stay fairly you know the same. But I agree, you have, and we do the same thing. You know, we go to trade shows and we'll walk into a booth and, you know, because our goal is obviously to meet companies who are interested in looking at new products. And when you walk into a booth, like you said, if you're dealing with the vice president of research and development or, or you know, the new product director, or you're dealing with a sales manager, you know, our pitch may be different because the sales manager may not be someone that can help us, but the, you know, the vice president of R&D can. So it's the same with an inventor, but I kind of tell them to keep it, you know, about the same, but again, you can quickly gauge whether, you know, if they're in your booth, you're walking into theirs, you can quickly gauge if this is someone that is a decision maker and, and, you know, you can always say if you're not the person, you know, I don't know if you handle this or not. Do you know who the person I should talk to? Who, who, who should I talk to? You know, that I always suggest doing that. We, we do that because again, that person might not be the correct person for you to talk to, but they know who is. And that's okay to ask them. And nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, well, you know what? I have their card here. I'll give it to you. You can follow up with them. Or they'll say, here, let me write it down for you. And, you know, that happens all the time. 
No, oh, I like that. Wow. Well, you know, I, I appreciate like this, you know, quick tip on uh, do's and don'ts here and we'll try to close off the interview um you know uh, uh yeah a lot of a lot of great tips you told us in the last you know 20 minutes on the on this topic because i think it's it's an important topic because that's the entry for a lot of inventors to get noticed as well as um you know talk about their product and talk very positively as you said about their product so we appreciate that here on nerd stalker so anyway we'll close off the interview so how can listeners get a hold of you and uh, you know ask you more questions about uh, elevator pitches um, absolutely they you can go to our website which is inventhelp.com and um, you know we have a, a media at inventhelp.com email address or they can email me personally also I'm on I'm on Twitter at invention at invention underscore show um, you know Facebook uh, like I said email me at nlininger at inventhelp.com and I'd be happy to help anyone who needs it no, thank you. I appreciate the, the time. And, 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 you know, hey, you might want to talk a little bit about your show that you hold every year. You, you, were, you just held it, I think, this, this, this last early summer, and then it's going on for next year, Impacts, right? Correct, yes. Impacts were the largest trade show for inventors in the country, and it's held here in Pittsburgh every year, like I said, since this is our national headquarters. And it'll be June 7th through the 9th, 2016, so we already have the date set. And uh, it's a three-day show, and it's it's you know a, a great um, opportunity for inventors to really present their product to do exactly what we've been talking about for the last twenty minutes. So to present their product to companies who are looking for new products. Oh, that's great! No, thanks again, uh, Nicole. I appreciate it. And now, uh, anyway, thanks for joining us, everyone. This is Greg Valeria, AK Social Greg, on Twitter for the Nerd Stalker Media Network, where we believe in tech, startups, design, and you. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and be careful out there. Hey, thanks, Nicole. Appreciate it. Thank you. It. See you later.